it's me. I've had my boiler repaired, so everything in the world is wonderful. Um, right, the purpose of the next sort of 25 minutes is to give us a chance just to surface what we've learned, what we missed um, about from the papers this morning. I should also say that during this, you will get a survey form um, that Tony Russell Rose has developed. Um, Tony, if you're there, you want a hand up. Do you want to say anything, sir? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat. Uh, to do that, I'm going to have to drop off this machine and go on this one. So just whoever's monitoring the uh, guest lobby, was just to let them know that I'm going to appear in the guest lobby in about 10 seconds. And as soon as I've done that, I'll put the link in the chat. And then you've got all the duration of the next session to vote for, uh, for the best paper, which I think you're going to introduce. Are you going to talk about that, Martin, or should I just... Well, do... Do you want to say a bit about your awards, Tony, why you've got the screen? Because we're going to segue from this into the awards and you'll take over. Yeah. OK, so once after the next panel session, uh, we're going to um, uh, switch gears to talk about the awards ceremony uh, without saying too much about it now, because obviously we've got a little dedicated slot for it in about half an hour. Um, there's five awards. Four of them have already been decided, and the fifth one you're going to decide now, which is the best paper that you've seen today. So that's it. I'm going to sign off now. I'll join on another machine, and then I'll put a link in the chat. Um, so keep your eye out for that, and uh, I'll hand back over to Martin. Okay, thank you, Tony. So I'm open for comments. Either raise your hand and we'll spot you, or stick something in the chat, and I'll distribute it. Um, because I want to try to synthesize what we've heard. And I think for me, just to start it off, I think we have shifted, as I inadvertently mentioned in my presentation this morning, to really thinking about what the user expectation is of the systems they are using. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, we then have to back, go into the back end and say, how do we support the customer experience rather than have we got the best index we have ever built? Um, and it's a rubbish UI, but aren't you grateful you've got a UI at all? Which seems to have been the history of enterprise, well, a search in general uh, for far too long. Um, but I think also, and I think this is both to Teresa and to uh, Tim, and it comes back to a comment that Katrina made this morning about the time dimension. We very rarely talk about time other than that metadata, oh, is it between 1906 and 1908 or whatever. In other words, we we'll look at date range rather than time. And in date range, and that made me thinking, Tim, that maybe what we should be doing is something like indexing an etymological dictionary so that we could detect mm -hmm. when a certain word came into language so we didn't use that word if we were going to do a search prior to that date. That's a fun idea. I like that concept. Um, you know, that's, that would be my kind of, that would be my kind of fun, that would be a fun thing to play with, wouldn't it? Um, I, th I, think it I think exactly that kind of thing is important. But equally, um, if look, it is another way round, because the language that Mike is going to be the language of today. We can't, I can't. I a legitimate who who is coming to our um, collection to know the language objects was created so it's more like a cross language retrieval challenge yeah. of of of, tr of 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 term translation i think uh, and making use of that time travel dictionary that you're describing to 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 augment a search with the right with the right kind of um additional terms yeah um rather than rather than limiting but 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 absolutely some kind of some kind of um, concept of terminology over time is important. I mean, uh, if you want to, if you really want to have fun, start talking about place search in archives, place name search in archives. How do you do that? 
because the place you're looking for may have existed in the Middle Ages, but it may have been called something completely different. Yeah. How do you know? Well, you've got to have a time travel gazetteer. Well, they're really hard to come by. <laughs> Yeah, because I was looking at yesterday, I was doing some genealogical research, and I'm looking for a road in Kensington, which is no longer there. Yep. But for me, it's actually quite important to know when that road name changed. Yep. Because that is an indicator of when they may have moved in or out of that road. Yep. But, but tracking down Hill Grove, Hampstead, there's no way, unless I go umpteen maps from the... Scottish, yeah. what is it? The National Library of Scotland store yeah. them all for some reason, and look at each one in. Oh, it, that's when it disappeared. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there was, there's, there is, there is something called the English Place Name Database yeah. that was was constructed by by an academic, I think, in Bristol. I'm afraid I don't remember his name, um, but that takes the extreme uh, to the point where individual fields. In, uh, in 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 different villages around the West Country, have time travelled names associated with them, um, and 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 that is an impossible is it presents an impossible task to populate yeah. across the whole country. So I'm supposed to be chairing this, not asking the questions. I'm Comments? sorry. No, not at all. No, I'm just. Uh, I think you've done a lot of work here, Tim and Teresa. So comments from from the audience. Any more hand raises, or do you just want to type something in the in the in the box? Or would one of the speakers like to comment? Teresa, you look expectant. I did. I just <laughs> wanted to piggyback a little bit of what Tim said around this idea of time, and um, you know, there's there's a lot of web uh as, as i'm sure you uh, have experienced martin there's some of these web content management systems that actually allow you to archive an entire moment in time of the website mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. search the website as it was on this day and this is particularly important in uh financial and highly regu regulated industries yep. where you have to have you, know, you have to be able to say this is what we had on the website on this date and at this time mm -hmm. uh because some something might have happened you know, during that time, and you have to have a, a record of what it was like then. And uh, it's almost like a, a corporate Wayback Machine. Uh, if you all rem remember the Wayback Machine, it's a still uh, the Wayback Machine still exists. It does it, yeah. So I haven't <laughs> even looked. I haven't looked at the Wayback Machine for a long time. Um, Completely exists. But there's there's internal uh, web content management systems and some damn systems that allow you to even roll back at least a hundred versions, you know, and to be able to, to search what the metadata was at that time, in addition to what the file looked like at that time. So just worth mentioning in that context, I think. And I'm, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna say that we have the same technology. In fact, we use exactly the same technology in the National Records of Scotland. Mm -hmm. We time travel Scottish government websites. And we've been, we, in some cases, we've been literally in the, uh, capturing them on a daily basis through the last, uh, 18 months tracking precisely what instructions were given to the population of Scotland in respect of the pandemic, truly day by day. Um, and we, we we have a collection now that it it hasn't yet that collection hasn't been yet made available, but will enable researchers to time travel um, Scottish government databases in exactly that way. The technology that is often used is something called Memento in case people haven't become yeah. aware of it. It's a it's an amazing thing where you literally drag a slider and the and the and the the, the website changes in front of your eyes. It's the most most fantastic uh, kit. Um, and it, and it is and it is the same people. It's the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine that are, that are doing in fact they're our suppliers. They deliver that service for us. But um, but but they do it they, they do it on a on an epic scale. Okay, Andy Farland, a question from you, or a comment? Well, yeah, it's just a comment really. I mean, one of the things when in my talk this morning, I tried to. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I was totally successful, but you have uh, attention. You have uh, on the one hand, you have all this wonderful technology, AI technology, which is going to solve the world, solve all our problems. No, no, it isn't fairly obviously uh, um on on the other hand you have the user um who uh, uh, is perhaps worried about this technology because they're sort of losing control uh, you know um 
So how do we resolve that tension between actually providing a technology that is going to give the user what's, what they want, simultaneously providing them sufficient control over that technology that they have enough trust and faith in it so that there's sufficient transparency. And that could be in digital asset management, it could be in archives, it could be in journalism, it could be in, particularly in systematic review, obviously, I, you know, Tony and I have done some work on explainability, as you well know. So there's, there's this gap here that in all of these fields that we need to we need to uh, 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 re reduce the gap between. Sorry, my, the words just won't come out at the moment. Do, do you, does that make sense? Am I make? Am I or just am I, am I just rambling? <laughs> uh, Andy, while you're on the when you're there, um, Vince McNamara has asked, how does uh, D minor deal with the time dimension in news stories? Um, at the moment, it it it, it doesn't. But it's something that we'll look into. That we need to look into. Uh, I mean, we have this idea of okay, you have time ranges, but that's not fully implemented yet. Uh -huh. But it, it, it will have to be dealt with. So, so for example, Philip Green, you're looking into uh, uh, why he's lost, lost, you know, why why he lost his knighthood. Well, that's a time period in which that that happens so you really narrow need to narrow down your range of search mm. one of the things that struck me earlier on today was the contribution by olivia and the intersection of psychology and information retrieval because we are dealing in information retrieval with how our brain the semantic element or cognitive or whatever word you want and we often make assumptions based on our own biases about how people will react to displays to words or whatever and there is a, a tremendous amount of re research being done in in psychology but not at on our ir level but how we react to text size color all sorts of things and it strikes me that's a very good blend of some skills, but I, it's the first time I've really thought about it as deeply as I did when Olivia was talking. Anyone got some, seen that the same way? I, I, I would agree. To hear the whole of Olivia's talk, the, the first part that I was able to hear, um, I was really crossed. I had to, had to duck out for half an hour to another meeting because it was, it was clearly, going to go to something that I was deeply interested in. The Again, because we're dealing with different people with different needs, but very specific needs in specific contexts, those perceptions uh, and how our collections are perceived is, is really important. Um, and our, our, our front end at the moment is you didn't hear it here is abysmal okay just to be clear um i'm uh, the, the the our current setup is not what it should be and requires enormous amounts of expertise and understanding and uh, in in the user and we need to move to a position where um those cognitive loads and those clutters and all this other stuff that olivia was talking about uh, are, are mitigated hugely one of the things that Andy knows I'm fascinated in is dyslexia. And, and if Therese is there, maybe she's got a thought about this, but about one in eight of us suffers from dyslexia in some way. It's a spectrum disease. You cannot say it's this end or that end. And it varies from people to people. And I'm wondering, Teresa, whether there's any thought given in the commercial world to, the, to who is using the screens and whether they are um, whether the language in fact is impenetrable yeah. by someone who doesn't have that visual acuity uh, yes <laughs> but it's come, <laughs> it's come terribly late honestly uh, just the awareness of it has taken far too long um, but and, and and sadly it's 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 probably mostly been driven by commercial interests where people realize, Oh, why didn't they buy our software? You know, and and then and then somebody says, "Well, 
the user interface was overwhelming or the text was too small and there was no way for us to use it on a tablet or it just just not thinking through the user experience um, and and also just the evolution of the fact that these these tools have gone from being you know built by engineers alone you know it's just like oh it's a, it's a, it's we're just putting a thing on top of a database you know it doesn't really matter what it looks like <laughs> but now it's um it's about getting tasks done and it's about thinking that through uh but it's about all the different sorts of users and their perceptions and their their different abilities and their different uh capabilities that they that they have essentially different views of the interface for and these these enterprise applications are being thought through to a much greater extent you know the personas uh the use case scenarios and even something as quote unquote you know simple as search <laughs> you know they, they have to think through well how are all the different people going to want to not just type something in a search box but browse uh filter the results uh, and even, you know, I had a client say to me a couple of days ago, we have to keep folders. You know, my users are on the older side and they <laughs> are used to the folder paradigm and I can't give them all these fancy filters that move around. And, you know, and, and so thinking that through is really, really important, um, you know, regardless of whatever ability or difference a person might have. You can, know? I, can I come in on that? Of course. Again, uh, it, it's. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to introduce another tension here. I like. I, I like my tensions, um, it, and it's about designing for for the general population and designing for people with uh, with differences. So I'll give you a very very good example of that. Um, most search engines are designed for the general user, you know, and that they're, they're all optimized specifically for use by. Uh, you know, millions and millions of people who have really no impairments. Now, I'm particularly interested in this, as Martin knows, I, 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 I've done some work in the area of dyslexia and information. Control. It's one of my key research areas. Um, and it's fairly obvious, actually, that their, their needs in terms of the way they formulate queries, the spelling mistakes they make are different, the way they view research, uh, view uh, um, uh, 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 results pages is different and the way they view documents is different and that is different to people who have visual impairments who use screen readers and that their their, their information be, uh, searching behavior is completely different so what we what we actually need sometimes it's all right you design for the general user but actually we need specific interventions for specific people so what works for dyslexic users isn't going to work for people with visual impairments, mm -hmm. isn't going to work for people with hearing impairments or people with aphasia who have not just uh, uh, cognitive impairments, but also physical impairments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we need to start looking into it's all very well saying, OK, great, we've we've right. Great. You know, we've designed that this is a really good interface. No, no, it isn't. No, you haven't considered all your range of users. Yeah. yeah, I'll shut up now. Yeah, uh, I see Scott. You've perfect. Scott, you've joined us. Um, can I can I, I pitch, can I pitch one at you? Because Senequa are one of the few companies that give what you might call a customizable UI. Um, and we're discussing here the ability to to match UI to to function to task and whatever. Could you just perhaps comment on what drove that? direction for you and how you're finding the reaction from your customers in having that quasi I say quasi because there are limits customizable user interfaces yeah uh, well first I should say you know Cinequa is a uh, it's a commercial uh, enterprise search engine our customers are typically you know these large um, sort of globally geographically distributed organizations and um, I think what what drove us to really invest in changing our UI framework in the last 18 months or so is just the old one getting very stale, you know, a lot of technical debt built up in the software and also kind of a uh, less and less taste uh, on the on the part of our customers and more like our systems integrator network to learn 
uh, a commercial vendor's proprietary UI. So we, you know, we looked at sort of what was available out there and what um, web developer type personas were using. Um, and we, you know, we adopted, uh, we actually gravitated towards Angular at the time, if you're familiar. And what we found is that by sort of re-architecting and creating a separation layer um, of our UI in, into Angular, uh, it not only allowed us to get all the benefits of that framework, the componentization and, and sort of the performance benefits of a modern framework, but it allowed um, people that were new to Cinequa to get up to speed much more quickly because they probably already had, you know, 80% of the skills they needed. Um, so that was that familiarity benefit that um, I think we knew, but we were surprised at how big a benefit that was. So I think that was, those were sort of the drivers and the reality that we've experienced um, in, in making what was a pretty major cutover uh, to it to a new UI framework. And you also have the you face the problem, and it was alluded to in the first presentation today from Katrina, that in the in the organization you need to search different repositories which will have different metadata, different schemas, and whatever. Um, you're not just searching a web server. And I know it's not as simple as that, but but this also must present some challenges to you in accommodating different repositories within a within a user interface well for sure I, I i mean the reason people are searching in different repositories i guess is because they have a different uh goals and objectives and, and different roles within these organizations so to the extent that the uh, user experience i'm not just talking about the ui now the, but the user experience the you know, the vocabulary, the, uh, you know, any kind of enrichment that we do or, or, or interpretation of meaning, um, all of that has to be um, kind of easily configurable in our minds because what our builders, you know, the, either the customers themselves or maybe more um, commonly the systems integrators, um, they're trying to build something that is, in, you know, as intuitive as, as, um, as contextual as, as they can. So it's not gonna be just a list of links that come back from a query like, like you know, search is commonly known as. It, it's, it's gonna be a, um, an interface and a user experience that you know, doesn't require training, I guess would be the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. Uh, Olivia, are you, on, are you online over the, up there in Scotland? Maybe not. Okay, because one, one of the things that Olivia was mentioning this morning was operating displays like an aircraft under stress conditions. And one of the things I remember Neil, Jacob Nielsen pointing out a long time ago is that aircraft cockpits, the core elements of the altimeter and the compass and things are always in the same place. Even though there's clutter around it, you know where the altimeter is gonna be relative to the control sticks and things like this. And it seems that probably there's a lot of work being done there, which hasn't, that if you like, I think that we've been driven too much by design principles rather than cognitive principles when we've been designing user interfaces. Now, how big should we make the font? Should we move it? Is this two columns wide or one column wide? Rather than, why is it there anyhow? Okay, how are we doing? Uh, any, any other comments because in a minute we have to pass across to, to, to Tony. Helen, are you, are you there, Helen? Ask to unmute. Me? Yeah, hello, Helen. Hello. We've been quite light, light, light on taxonomies and metadata today. I know, that's okay. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> but from your point of view, what, I mean, uh, how have you seen sort of the interest in, in taxonomy management change over the last year or so? I mean, I'm looking at in the context that has the pandemic pushed any of your clients to be pro more proactive in thinking about tagging your metadata? Um, yeah, I, th I think so. I think it's because people are working more remotely, it's exposed a lot of gaps in people's systems, um, finding documents, um, connecting with people. So yeah, the last few months I've seen projects popping up all over the place. 
um, for taxonomies and people are looking at knowledge graphs and they don't necessarily need a knowledge graph, but they've seen a presentation about it. So, yeah, and I think, I, I, I do think there's not quite enough understanding of taxonomy and search interaction yet, but we're working on it kind of one client at a time. Um, just been talking to someone that's really interested in kind of using my taxonomic background with their search engineering team which you know that's exactly my kind of meat and drink so i'm relatively bullish that out of all this horribleness a lot of good is coming out helen while you're online do a promo for your book <laughs> um okay no thank you very much martin um so i'm working with facet publishing on a book called Taxonomy, it's a very original title obviously, um, which is um, an anthology um, of 16 different chapters around the use and management of digital taxonomies. So it's all written by practitioners and it's intended to be very complementary to other books about taxonomies and search. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be a really good addition to the literature but that's coming out some point in the spring next year. Given there's so little, it will bound to add something. <laughs> yeah, and I think it'll be a good read. It's the sort of thing you'll be able to dip in and out of. It, it's not an academic text, you know, so I think that's an advantage in some ways. It's people that have, like me, that have really been in the trenches and have all the battle scars, trying to pass on good advice and just giving people enough of the theory to to get them going and there's the stuff about search in it as well good. plenty of good meaty search stuff and that's a good introduction tony are you ready to be an awarding person <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's if we're all set um i just put a little note in the chat to say uh, last orders for the vote um so if, oh wow, we just had a few come in. I can watch this in real time. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> oh, I didn't think they'd been. Oh, spoiler alert. No, seriously, I'm gonna keep keep it all as quiet as I possibly can. So when I do a screenshot, I can't be careful I share the right screen. <laughs> Otherwise, it might uh, might be a real spoiler alert. Okay, oh, I'll hand over to you, Tony. Yeah. Oh, so sorry, I thought you already had. No, not well. Formally, <laughs> yeah. you know, here's the battle. Control. I control. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So I presume you're all here and see me. I'm not just talking to myself. Um, okay. So thank you, Martin. I'm just checking in case there's any other comments on the chat. It looks like everybody's voted. It looks like we've got. Oh wow! <laughs> I might have to update my slides at the last minute. I'd already written in. Um, but uh, no, I think we're still just about okay. And I will, I'm gonna, I'm stalling for time slightly just to see if there's any final votes, but I'm gonna sort of do going, going on. And I'm gonna officially close the poll. So if you haven't voted, um, I'm gonna say three, two, one, and I am gonna close the poll now. Right, so there we are. And, oh, it's close, but we do have a winner. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, right, so I now need to make sure I share the right screen. So just bear with me a second. Okay. Right. Uh, let me share this one. I hope that's the right screen. Can everybody see that? Can you see a screen with uh, yep. search solutions written on? Okay, good. Yep. Let me try and get the chat window where I can see it as well. Great. All right. So thanks. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, everybody. Um, slight change of switching gears here for a moment. So we're going to go from that uh, very learned, um, informative discussion to something that's all about a celebration, really of uh, looking back on 2021 and picking out some notable successes uh, amongst our own community. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Search Industry Awards, uh, the background to this is obviously IRSG has been going for many years. Actually, I'm not sure when it started, but we're in the decades, not single years. 
And over that period of time, there's been several awards that uh, some of you may know about, you know, like the Karen Spark Jones Award, many of you will know about. Uh, there's the best paper at ECIR. So there's various awards that the IRSG is, you know, responsible for and, and works towards. Um, and of course, that, that's all great. But um, most of these awards traditionally have been uh, by and for the academic community, which of course is, is slightly um, uh, a little bit odd in the sense that the BCS is of course a professional organization. And actually most of the members of the IRSG are uh, in fact practitioners, not researchers. So really the idea behind the uh, Search Industry Awards was trying to address that balance a little bit and to have something that celebrates practitioners successes among our own community uh, and, and you know recognition for our own individual members so that's really the background to what we've done it's run over the past few years there's been a little bit of a hiatus partly due to covid partly due to some other reasons um, but we'll be going a few years i think the first one was about 2016. So don't worry, this isn't a spoiler alert. These are the previous winners from um, the last time we ran the awards. So you can see we had three, three award categories last time, most promising startup, which I think went to uh, search up uh, by CXB commerce experts. Best uh, search project was uh, Elsevier data search and the best presentation was Mark Harwood of Elastic. Uh, so those are the three that we had last time. <clears throat> I think we slightly, in recent years, we've expanded it. So we actually have five award categories, and I'm pleased to say we had a strong field of nominations for all the award categories this year. So it was a competitive process, which is great. Uh, and those categories were the best search user experience, um, the most promising startup or new enterprise, uh, best open source project, search professional of the year, and the best paper or presentation at Search Solutions. So as I said, I'm pleased to say we've had entries for all those categories and it was competitive. Um, I should acknowledge the efforts of our judging panel and they do their stuff completely separate to me. So I just hand them the nominations, they do their stuff and then they hand their results back to me. So lots of kudos and respect and thanks go to these three individuals who've given their time to this process. Paul Clough, I don't know if he's still on the call, um, but uh, obviously Paul was our second speaker today. So thank you very much, Paul. I hope you didn't vote yourself. Um, so he's head of data science at Peak Indicators. And of course, many of you will have already met him today. Agnes, Agnes Molnar, founder and managing consultant at Search Explained. Agnes, are you on the call? If you aren't, give us a wave. Thank you very much for your contribution. And Paul Cleverly, who many of you will know, he's spoken at Search Solutions twice i think at least once possibly twice uh, he's a tech startup founder and, and, and visiting professor at um uh the robert gordon university i think it is so thank you very much to paul uh, and paul and agnes for doing their um uh, sterling work on the, the judging so on to the winners themselves. And I'm going, through, going to go through the five in the order that you just saw. Normally, we, if we do this face-to-face, -face, we kind of have a little bit more of a moment with presentations and so on, but I'm just going to do it just as a reveal. So the first category was the best search user experience. And I am pleased to announce that the winner for that is open question answering on Lexis Plus. So congratulations to LexisNexis. Um, they have won this category this year. I don't believe uh, that they, they were able to join us today, which is a shame. Um, in fact, the person who submitted this is somebody whom I've worked with actually at LexisNexis. So it's really nice to renew the acquaintance. Um, and that's just the first, the, the, what they've submitted is the first open format question answering system for the legal domain. In fact, I think LexisNexis won um, uh, an award at our very first awards ceremony back in 2016. So good to see them back and many congratulations for, for producing yet another winner. Um, and I'm guessing nobody from Lexis is on the call. If they are, please do let me know in the chat. But I wasn't expecting them. So anyway, well done, Lexis. So the next category is most promising startup. And the winner, and this was a this was hotly contested this particular category. And I'm pleased to say that the winner is Resolute AI, uh, who are a New York-based startup that's created an AI-driven platform to search major 
FDA databases in the public domain in a federated way. So well done. Um, virtual round of applause for Resolute AI. Uh, I, as, as before, I don't think they can join us today. If anybody from Resolute AI is on the call, please, please do make yourself known. Um, but um, we'll be in touch with you in due course. So well done. So on to our third category, which was the best open source project. And I'm pleased to announce that the winner for that is Sightseer X, which is one of the largest open source academic search engines. It's all the code and documents are open access under a Creative Commons license. It has two to three million hits a day and approximately half a million downloads a day. Many of us will be familiar with Sightseer X and many of us rely on it as a crucial source of uh, you know, uh, scholarly lit literature and more. So well done to Sightseer X. And I do believe we have Lee Giles with us today. Lee, are you on the call at the moment? Yes, I am. Oh, hi. Well done. Thank you for joining us. How does it feel to be winner of the best open source project 2021? Oh, it's a great, it's a great feeling. Uh, it's uh, thank you very much for this honor. Uh, the sites of your team, um, you know, we get a lot of good feedback, but it's, it's, there's nothing like having this kind of recognition. Um, we, Sometimes the feedback is, oh, you didn't index my paper properly. Or uh, one, of the, one of the more interesting ones is, thank you uh, for thinking that my resume is an academic paper, but it's really not. Could you please remove it? Uh, this, is, this is one of the issues when you have automated um, ways for doing, for downloading and, and uh, verifying and uh, indexing academic papers. Many thanks. That's well, well done. Congratulations. And thank you for joining us at relatively short notice from, I'm guessing, somewhere in the US in a completely different time zone to the rest of us, I'm guessing. Yes, it's, uh, I'm, in Penn, I'm at Penn State University in Pennsylvania. Okay. And All the right. time zone is 11 in the morning. Oh, it's not too bad then. All right. At least we didn't get you out of bed. <laughs> All right. Okay. So well done. Thank you, Lee Giles, and to the Science Theater team. Um, and on to our penultimate award category, we have our Search Professional of the Year, and I'm pleased to announce that the winner for that is Dr. Stuart Mackey, who, whom some of you may know. I, I first bumped into Stuart at, I think it was Kai in Glasgow in 2019. Uh, Stuart was the KTP associate on um, a KTP project with uh, Lee Fazapardi. Uh, he was with BIP Solutions Limited and was tasked with improving the BIP search solutions for procurement searches and to increase their relevance through machine learning. So well done, Stuart. Stuart, are you with us today? Hello. Hello, <laughs> yes, Stuart. Hi. That was a bit unexpected. <laughs> you caught me in the hop there. <laughs> uh, thanks well very done. Much. How does it feel? Uh, fantastic super yep <laughs> great <laughs> yeah it was a good experience the ktp i guess um it's a really good way um like the one of the talks earlier that kind of bridging the gap between academic and, and industry um, yeah the, the ktp is a really good scheme to, yeah. to manage that transition exactly yeah uh, thanks very much all right no problem at all and i'm guessing you're uh, industry counterpart, the, the knowledge provider, I guess, would be the way of putting it. Leaf, are you on the call as well? Yeah, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, Stuart did an amazing job there. I was, I was actually um, looking at, I think, Martin's uh, presentation where he went through the whole timeline of, you know, implementing search solutions in, 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 um, in a company, and uh, Stuart did an amazing job at pushing through all those barriers and hurdles and, and, and points all the way through and uh, and really created like uh, some excellent work out of that. Yeah, so it was uh, so it's great to see that Stuart's done, uh, got the, uh, the search professional of the year. I think it's well-deserved. Congratulations, Stuart. Yeah, yep. yeah well Thanks, done. Mate. Thanks, yeah, well done to both of you. Great, thank you. So on to our final category and um, this is the best paper award and the polling closed a moment ago. It was quite close, but we did have a winner. 
So I'm pleased to announce that the best paper or presentation at Search Solutions 2021 goes to Olivia Folds. So for talking about crossing the 49th parallel of data and information science, which of course was, I think was the third presentation we had today. So well done, Olivia. Are you, are you still with us, Olivia? She's got problems with her mic, I think. Oh, okay. All right. Well, many congratulations from all of us. I thought it was a, a very, I didn't vote, obviously, because being at this end, I think that would have been a conflict of interest for me. But I thought it was an excellent presentation. So many, many congratulations. All right. Okay, so just the final, so well done to all our winners. Um, frame certificates will be made available to you guys. And of course, there'll be a uh, um, you know, you'll be forever listed as the winners on our website. So, um, yeah, congratulations for that. So, um, just to leave you with a note about 2022. I know it's early to start thinking about that already, but um, I'm anticipating that we will hopefully meet in person next year and hopefully be able to run um, a, a, an in-person event uh, awards ceremony. I'm guessing that we'll probably have the same five categories, things that all five were quite competitive this year, or at least I hope we can have all five. There's a potential for a sixth one. You know, there's, there's uh, occasionally people come up with suggestions for how about an award for X, Y, Z, and we think, well, maybe we could do that. So if you have an idea for a sixth category, please do let us know. Uh, I, I'm anticipating the applications for next year's award will probably open sometime between Easter and the summer of 2022. In fact, summer's a bit, little bit late. I'd anticipate we'll probably try to open up around April or May, something like that. So please do let us know. If you, if you didn't make it this year, there's always next year. And, and if you, what you've seen has inspired you to share your own successes, please do put a note in your diary to, um, to make a nomination or self-nomination next year. And likewise, if you, if you want to help, if you want to be a judge or if you want to be a part of the process, again, get in touch. Uh, with, with myself or any of the org other organisers of Search Solutions. Great, and on that note, I'll just say thank you once again to our winners and thank you once again to our judges, and I will hand back to Martin for the next panel. Okay, thank you, Tony, and thank you to everyone. And uh, yeah, that was that was well, well done, Tony. A nice broad range of wins. It's nice to see people winning in Search. So often, you know, oh no, Search really can work well when you put your mind to it. Right, the, we're coming to a, 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 a chatty close. Um, a bit of background before I introduce the, um, the participants. Uh, this year I tried an experiment with the support of the conference committee to have these themes running through, and they really were sort of topics maybe rather than themes, with a couple of papers on each one um, that uh, uh, so get a bit of a compare and contrast. And I think Tim and uh, Teresa were one of the best examples of that. One dealing with you know, the past and one dealing with it may change tomorrow, future. And this, I, I arbitrarily sort of chose these themes based on people who, who'd um, put forward proposals and things like this. What I've asked our final panelists to do, and this is, if you like, close just to the panelists to give them a chance, is to talk about what they think should be the themes for this conference in 2022, because it makes organizing it so much easier if you can blame someone else for what the themes were. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask um, our, our panelists uh, in sequence, and I'll just briefly introduce them to you. Scott Parker is the product um, director, strategy director at Cinequa, which is a uh, French owned um, and one of the, you know, the largest of the uh, commercial search operations um, and has a huge amount of experience in search going back a long way. So he, Scott's on the commercial side and then to balance him and keep him real, we have Charlie Hull, who's uh, also got a long experience in search, but on the open source, open code side um and is currently with open source connections and like me a member of the search network if you haven't heard of that you should go and look us up uh then uh, we have Ian Ness from professor from Glasgow University um who's who really is one of the gurus of gurus when it comes to 
uh, information retrieval from a, an academic perspective, but also very applied around um, you know, developing products and things like that. And last, but by no means least, all the way from Norway. Well, Scott, I think you're in Pittsburgh, are you? I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, yeah. yep. Yeah, so Katrina comes to us. I thought it was Oslo. It turns out to be, it's actually Gothenburg, but what's a different country between friends? And Katrina, uh, also a very distinguished academic, but looking much more at information management, how we address tasks and how solve tasks through, uh, uh, through the um, medium of, uh, of search and browse and everything else. So what I've asked each of the four to do, and we'll start off, if you don't mind, Scott, with you on the basis you're the farthest away, and it's early in the morning, so you're much more active than we are, <laughs> um, is just to give us sort of a two or three minute, what do you think at this time next year will be the hot topics, the ones that we really should be focusing in on as professionals and as a conference organiser over the next year? What do you see bubbling up from your perspective? Right. Well, I did prepare some some notes here from my three uh, three minute perspective. So let me just start sort of reminding everyone that commercial search vendors come in many shapes and sizes. The industry's obviously um, been on the move for decades. Uh, some focus on website search. Others focus on Internet search. Uh, some focus on helping e-commerce companies compete with, uh, you know, Amazon, Walmart's of the world while others cater towards open source development communities. Um, some offer software as a service only, while others offer appliances that uh, is usually geared towards uh, you know, simplicity of deployment. So lots of, uh, it's like a box of chocolates, right? You don't know what you're gonna get until you kind of bite into one of them, right? So uh, at Cinequa, our focus is enabling what I was referring to earlier, we call them knowledge intensive companies. They're, like I said earlier, large, they're usually geographically distributed. Not everybody knows each other. Um, and they're trying to, in some ways, drive innovation. And what we try to do with our platform and our services is help connect people to the insights and the expertise um, in the flow of their work. So it's a little bit tied into what I said earlier about, you know, kind of crafting those um, insight applications to, to be contextual. Um, we see, you know, the, the, the needs that aren't going to be any surprise to this group um, driving the market. It's improved productivity through knowledge discovery, first and foremost, um, enabling employees to use uh, the insights, you know, that would otherwise be hidden to have uh, through more personalized experience, right? So using all of the signals that, um, that the technology can sort of access and make sense of. Uh, number two, faster time to market for new products. You know, we're definitely seeing um, that need, uh, the, the, they need decreased cost of quality, especially in research and development. We work with a lot of pharma companies, for example, a lot of product engineering firms. That's sort of the space where I'm coming from. Um, and then thirdly, uh, lower operational costs, lower business risk across these organizations. And there I'm talking about, you know, things like product maintenance, customer service, and those risk and compliance functions. So uh, where do we see the, these business needs um, best being catered to? to? We see uh, sort of the three technological capabilities as critical drivers. So intelligent processing of both the existing and the new information sources. In an extreme case, think of a merger and acquisition scenario where they're trying to really you know, get their money back as quickly as possible. So we see technology that sort of augments the, the employee's ability, um, taking multilingual text-based content um, and turning it into insights, um, improving relevance and personalization are paramount. Uh, we believe neural search, um, we've been talking a lot about neural search, is a next generation NLP capability that's gonna bring a, a, step, a real step change to relevance. So I think that's maybe worth talking about. We see support for hybrid in, uh, deployments in uh, host environments, especially with the large organizations we work with, they're moving workloads to the cloud. We see a need to support these hybrid deployment approaches in the near future at least. Uh, and actually one of our strategic initiatives at Cinequa is to provide uh, the best possible experience for an on-premise and, and also multi-cloud deployments and sometimes a combination. 
And then lastly, um, we see tools for accelerating delivery of these custom applications that I touched on earlier for knowledge discovery and also integrating those capabilities within digital workplace ecosystems that all, all these organizations that we're all sort of building out um, maybe more rapidly because of the pandemic. Uh, we think the digital workplace is maturing to be really the place where work gets done. We think the key to advancing that work, especially for these innovative organizations is gonna be collaboration or it is collaboration, you know, like we're doing here on this call. And so we see as a search vendor collaborative functions as a pretty exciting growth area. The idea being that systems are now proactively, more and more proactively bringing insights into the flow of work and the people are interacting with the content and the insights and the ideas to generate new and improve act on. So accelerating the kind of collective learning in the organization. So I think those would be my three, the intelligent processing, the hybrid deployments, and the uh, and really the tool support for delivery. Thank you, Scott. Charlie, can I come to you next? Um, if you want to give a bit of background to yourself and where you see next year. Sure. So yeah, I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Charlie Hull, been in the search business about 20 years, and I work for Open Source Connections and where a specialist consultancy helping people with search relevance so getting the right results back in the right order um, and we focus mainly on open source technologies so uh, i think i've got three three trends and three things to think about um, one is, is i think um, where the open source work search world is at the moment which is we're seeing some very interesting things happening in terms of licensing um, the growth the use of open source technologies by massive cloud vendors such as amazon puts uh, companies that uh, rely on uh, open source to drive their business in an interesting position because Amazon is eating the world in many ways. And so we've seen a big reaction to that with Elastic, uh, the company behind the Elasticsearch open source engine, effectively changing the license of Elasticsearch. They've effectively made it not open source anymore. Now, depending on who you talk to, you can argue it's still open code, it's still freely available, but under the, the, you know, the accepted definition, it's no longer open source. Amazon's reaction was to fork the Elasticsearch code base. So there's now another open source search engine called OpenSearch, which is sponsored by Amazon. So that's all very interesting. But uh, it's a if you're using open source software, you've got to be pay attention to the license. This isn't just a, uh, a you know an, an uninteresting bit of paper. It, it is actually key to your strategy and you know the risks and benefits of using open source software. So pay attention to that. And I think we're going to see more of this. Uh, companies that have you know, commercialize open source in one way or the other. If someone big like uh, Amazon comes knocking, they may have to change their game. So that's my first trend. Um, I think the uh, the other uh, thing I see is e-commerce search. And uh, especially there's a lot of investment going to e-commerce at the moment, of course, everyone locked in their houses. And, you know, you can see the huge growth of e-commerce over the last couple of years for obvious reasons. And if you can't find it, you can't buy it. So people are now paying huge attention to where how search impacts uh, e-commerce. And this is an area we're increasingly working with. And uh, happily, the open source search engines are now getting to the point where they can compete with some of the closed source e-commerce packages in terms of search. And for those companies that want really want to own their search, we see this as a, uh, a fantastic way to do that. Um, the third thing uh, to talk about is the future of search. And what we're seeing is that the next generation of search will be you know, taking in vector, vector search. So not just indexing text, um, which has really been the last kind of 30 years of search, it's the next generation is being able to index and store different qualities of different things, be they shapes on images or be they you know, different other different qualities, sounds or um, uh, there's all kinds of different things you can store in vectors. Um, and this is really where search is going. Uh, the trouble is a lot of the current search engines, especially in the open source world, are, aren't very good at doing vectors. There are some notable exceptions. Uh, I encourage you to check out the Vespa search engine built by some of the team that put together the fast search engine back in the day, if you remember that. Clever people in Norway. Um, and there's lots of new ones popping up as well. There's lots of new search engines popping up that promise to do vector search and textbook search and combine the two. And they, you know, they, uh, in, in, they uh, incorporate a lot of innovations in the vector search space. That's where search is going. Of course, the question is, when is that actually going to be usable by ordinary human beings and uh, whether it'll end up added to existing search engine frameworks or some new one will come along and take over everything. So that's my top three. It's uh, license changes in open source, e-commerce search and open source and vector search, the next big thing. Okay. 
Ian, can you bring us down to Worth with a view of the world from Glasgow, which is the centre of the IR universe, I think, in many respects? No, actually, I'm going to uh, agree with uh, Charlie, right, uh, with respect to what he said in terms of uh, vector search, right? So we call it actually dance retrieval or dance search, right? And it is indeed an exciting new area for information retrieval. So it's actually a great time to be doing information retrieval research and to also to be deploying search engines these days. So this uh, idea of uh, what Charlie called um, vector search or what we call usually in academia dance search or dance retrieval is really a big new thing, right? And it is opening up IR, right? from the scratch. That means uh, things like uh, how to do effective and efficient retrieval, how to uh, uh, build uh, search engines, how to use data structures in a search engine is completely being revisited and rethought with this kind of idea of uh, dance retrieval. So instead of using sparse like inverted files, we move it on to this kind of dance embeddings like um, uh, structures that allow to do more semantic or more AI-like retrieval, right? So it will be indeed good to learn about experiences of SMEs and other specialized search services in how they are using the likes of BERT and uh, AL in search and recommendation tasks, right? Um, uh, how dense retrieval is helping them for which types of queries, how the dance retrieval uh, technology is being perceived by users. Uh, are there deployment difficulties? Because it is hard actually to deploy this kind of uh, 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 systems, right? And a related theme is um, what uh, Paul uh, Clough touched up on this morning, which is in terms of ML ops, right? Or uh, machine learning ops, right? So as we increasingly use machine learned models in search recommender tasks and the likes, it becomes increasingly more important to learn about the, how we do practical deployments of search, how we maintain them, how we deal with the longevity issues of ML driven search technologies. For example, when should we retrain uh, a machine learned model in search, right? how we deal with uh, governance issues, how we deal uh, with uh, legislative issues, right? Uh, and, and this is actually extremely important now, right? So for instance, Vespa, which was mentioned earlier by Charlie, has a number of ideas on how to deploy, right? This kind of uh, uh, dance retrieval techniques, right? So it is actually the right time to learn about best practices from practitioners about how they do their pipeline, right, in terms of search, what kind of ML ops, right, they have in place, and uh, how do they deploy these kind of models, right? A third theme that is uh, uh, gaining traction as well, not only in IR, but also in artificial intelligence in general, is this issue of uh, providing fair, uh, and trustable, and explainable search results, right? So um, you probably know that uh, the European Union is working on an artificial intelligence pact, which will require us to show that our search services, recommendation services uh, are fair, right? And are also transparent. So it will be interesting to know from practitioners and uh, various search providers, um, uh, what kind of pressure they are getting on, right? To become fair. Uh, who are they fair to? right? Uh, do their systems try to enforce a notion of uh, fairness? What parts of their search or recommendation systems they focus on making fairer? How do they evaluate fairness, right? Is this hurting their business income, right? So this is the kind of thing that would be very interesting to talk about, right? Because these are very hard challenges. And uh, a last theme from me, which is in relation to this issue of fairness and uh, machine learning uh, technology in search, is this idea of feedback loops in search or in recommender systems. So feedback loops are very well studied in recommender systems. And recently, there was a lot of work in academia on uh, uh, contrafactual learning, right, in, in learning to rank where they try to alleviate the position bias, right? So it's all good to have to take into account the user, but we need to be able to model the user behavior and avoid, and avoid the, uh, the, the bias that might result from user uh, uh, interactions with the system. 
So this is the kind of thing that would be good to, uh, to learn about from such practitioners, right? How do they deal with feedback loops when they try to take into account the user feedback or the user interactions with their system? Are they training on clicks, right? How are they evaluating their training models on clicks by users or views and the likes, right? Um, how are they uh, uh, mitigating biases from uh, the actions of the users and so on? So these are interesting actually topics, not only from an academic perspective, but they have actually very important uh, practical challenges, right? Thank you very much indeed. That's certainly some food for thought. Now then, Katrina, I'm not sure whether actually Oh yeah, Gothenburg is farther north than Glasgow, but there can't be much of it. So uh, what, what are your perspectives on the next year or so and what's going to emerge? Yeah, thank you. Uh, interesting points that have come out. Uh, I was afraid that my my stuff would be safe, but uh, no, uh, I guess my perspective is a little bit different. And I bring back the user users and in work organizations uh, that I think that will increase also in the future in interest and uh, we were earlier talking about the time and um, how timing is important for different kinds of questions that becomes uh, important and i now now i think that the time really is changing here and uh, one the first topic that um, i think uh, might be of interest to look closer is the, what are the effects of the pandemic uh, um years or a year the actual years and probably next year then and uh, the remote teleworking uh, on attitudes and use of um, uh, enterprise shared systems i think that people um, i am doing a longitudinal study about how people are using information in organization during during the pandemic from the very beginning and now I have done the second round and I noticed that there is a kind of um, change in a way how people are looking the their information tools uh, they kind of say oh I'm so surprised that this works so well um, and uh, another thing is that they are saying that well I am not anymore I am much more independent in my tasks I'm uh, able to use uh, the systems more effectively and I'm using them more because I don't have my colleagues around me so I can't go and ask when I get a question from a from person next door because they're they are not there uh, instead they are putting more effort on finding information on their own and this is kind of a good news for intranet uh, developers because uh, earlier the problem has been that people have been feeling that it is much easier to go and ask the ne next best person in the office and they have not been kind of keen to put some effort really to try to find information but now they are so this is i think i think that that could be an interesting topic to to see are the attitudes uh, towards uh, even in enterprise church systems uh, changing have people people become more tolerant with the information system have they learned to use this system better than earlier have they find workarounds if the system doesn't uh, uh, work out uh, as good as it should uh, how do they solve the problems when they are more um forced to turn to the information system. So I think that is my first uh, point. What is the teleworking effects? And the second point is uh, what is the, um, how people are viewing the cooperation with the, between themselves and uh, artificial intelligence systems? I don't think that the, maybe the, these systems are uh, replacing people, but rather they are um, there becomes a need to work uh, closer with the systems um, uh, in the future. So how does this cooperation look like? And I guess that here the other speakers also already have put some points about how, how does the recommendation system work and how, how, does the, how, do, how do people trust in these, uh, uh, these, um, these systems? So more not putting the people against the 
uh, artificial intelli uh, intelligence uh, technology, but more see how these two um, forces can work together. And finally, um, uh, I think that um, I, I could say that the Olivia's presentation really about that we really do need some technological support when comparing how what was the relevant information for our tasks 100 years ago is completely different today. So we can't really <laughs> sort that uh, information on our own. Uh, can, do I have a time for what is last? Of course, uh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I think my three minutes are long gone. Um, so the, I haven't got a watch on, you're all right. Very good. <laughs> so the last point I think that is of interest, and again on, uh, on related to the pandemic issues, is that uh, people are um, uh, has, having a social vacuum in the work office. They, don't, they are have, sharing much less social information between the peers. And uh, many are saying that they kind of... Uh, have difficulties to um, um, to know what is going on in in the office, and even though many workplaces have uh, introduced uh, uh, enterprise social media for this purpose, people feel that they don't kind of they can't really keep track on that. So maybe there is an opportunity to see how could uh, enterprise search system help people to manage uh, this social media information at the workplace. Uh, so so that, that I think might be an, also an interesting opening. Mm -hmm. But more all of my topics is really that I think that the time is, has come when people have become more um, um, willing to place effort and work with the information technology compared with how it has been before the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Can I just throw something up in the air? This is a curveball because I haven't told the panelists I was going to ask it because I've only just thought of it. But with, over the last couple of years, it's all been about teams, both of the capital T and the small T, how we can work together as teams. And yet search is still one person at one screen. Efforts to build collaborative search have basically failed. Sivrag Shah has put a lot of effort into it, but still no one that I know of offers a commercial, even an open source, where you could actually get a team working together to say, ah, that, that, that reminds me, what you should do is look for this rather than that. But search is a lonely occupation, yet we're told that teams is the way we work. There's a contradiction here I don't understand. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, the teams, uh, I don't know if this even is changing now when you don't uh, meet in the same room, but I think that the people have been quite uh, individual in, or they have been splitting their tasks so that the one group, they, one person takes the care of one issue and another one do, does the second. I think that they have experienced that put, if they would be searching together, that would be a waste of time. Uh, oh, so, that, that, so, so my experience is that people, um, they split the task of uh, searching and then come together to discuss the, the results. That is kind of efficiency question, okay. I guess. Okay. Can I go back now around the other way um, and perhaps go back to it? Um, from what you've been hearing, um, do you have any sense you need to change what you teach and how you teach it? Are, are you looking at revising your, your teaching? Yes, I mean, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, in uh, the information retrieval course that we have been teaching in Glasgow, we have completely, uh, let's say, changed the course now, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, we can't ignore uh, this kind of neural uh, IR era that is completely changing the field, right? Mm. But can you get the people coming in from the outside to say this is how it is being used? Or because, I mean, it's, it's a role I do at Sheffield. I come in and say, I don't care what you're inventing at the iSchool. That's not how it works in the, in, in the real world. We, we do try to have guest uh, speakers from uh, different um, 
uh, parts of the world. In fact, uh, we, we had uh, the Vespa speaker, for example, last week, right, uh, giving uh, a talk on uh, the way they do things in, uh, in Vespa. So I think we do show them examples of how uh, people are uh, deploying these kind of techniques, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we, I mean, clearly the information retrieval field actually is completely being transformed the last uh, year or two, right? And uh, uh, what we teach the students, right, in our IR courses need, of course, to, to be adapted, right? Mm -hmm. Charlie, I mean, your company has done a lot of training, particularly in what you, you describe as relevance engineering. I mean, that has developed well for you. What gap do you think you're filling? Is it because people can't get are not taught it at a university level or there are it's difficult to do self-teaching what, what's driven the, your success in that area well i think it's our belief you know from the beginning that um we need more search people uh if you've worked in search you know you have a kind of mindset about how to how work with search and and i'm going to be uh straight to the point here i think most search engines are basically the same and once you've worked with one you can probably work with another but those skills about thinking about both the business requirements and how to translate them into into actual you know uh, technical requirements that, that 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 you know that kind of way that search and uh, search bridges those two things you know what does the business actually need and then what should, should, should the search engine actually do to, to support that those skills are rare I mean, every single search presentation I see ends with a plaintive plea to, you know, we're hiring. Mm -hmm. um, the, the jobs channel in our Slack, in a relevant Slack, which we run, which has got 2,000 members in it now, is just full of people looking for search people. So we thought, well, let's try and make some. So our training is really there to help organizations actually build more relevance engineers. And we don't, you know, this isn't shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, this isn't going to uh, suddenly make us, um, you know, uh, redundant. Uh, it's really part of our mission to try and, uh, you know, empower search teams wherever we found, find them. Um, I think those particular skills of relevance engineering are something that would be a really interesting thing to teach at university level. Um, but uh, I, I also think it's it's a difficult one because it does cross, you know, it is cross-disciplinary. Not everyone who's in a, on a information retrieval course wants to think about the business implications, perhaps. Uh, and not everyone on a management or maybe a project management or product management course wants to learn about how search engines work. When they get into the actual job though they do need to be able to talk to each other and that's what we're trying to bridge scott would you like to say something about this in equa university because th this is you've obviously seen the same problem and you're addressing it in a i think a fairly unique way yeah um, i mean i'm thankful every day i go to work that um i work for a relatively small organization i mean compared to my former employer ibm cynica is pretty small and yet we have a center of excellence, which is something you don't see at a small company. And it's made up of people that have been around search uh, for a long time to have that mindset that Charlie was just talking about. And that was one of the gaps, especially back when we had, you know, more of a proprietary uh, front end and, you know, getting people uh, up to speed at scale. I'm talking now about systems integrators and resellers and, and even employees at, at our customer organizations. How do they quickly acquire the knowledge they need to, you know, do whatever, uh, tweak the relevance, uh, set up a connector, uh, sell the software? Maybe they're a reseller and they don't totally understand the value proposition. So using an LMS, a learning management system, and then completely sort of white labeling it and, and provisioning it out to our community um, has been a huge um, conversation starter. And it's been a huge benefit to kind of accelerating our business. Um, I, I can't say enough about it. Okay, well, that brings us, I see Udo lurking in the top right-hand corner of my screen. Can I thank uh, Katrina, Charlie, Scott? I had, thank you very much indeed for just you know, a little bit of your inspiration and, uh, and futurology and crystal ball and whatever. I'm really grateful for you staying around for the end and in, in Scott's case, getting up early in the morning, but never. <laughs> <laughs> to be there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and from me to all the, the delegates and the speakers, thank you so much for your support. Um, and we had some very successful tutorials yesterday. Um, interestingly, I think the most heavily one, Udo or Ingo, was the search evaluation one, which is something we've not talked about. But in the end, if you can't do good search evaluation, you will never learn whether you're doing the right thing.